ibn Abi Talib. That's a prayer that the Prophet's making. And Allah and the He made that dua. You support Ali, guaranteed Allah will support you. And on the day of Ghadir, we explore ways by which we can support the message of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Now my dear brothers and sisters, in our discussion tonight, first we'll present a brief historical analysis of how the Prophet gave this speech. And then we'll analyze excerpts of this speech. Many of us are not familiar with this very important sermon of the Prophet. So on, tonight in our discussion, we'll present a brief analysis of the sermon of Ghadir. So how did this speech, how did this sermon, how did this declaration come into being? The Prophet ﷺ, several months before he passed away, he was instructed by Allah to mobilize all Muslims to go to the Hajj. So the Prophet made an announcement, any Muslim who hears my call and who is able to go to the Hajj that year, come, come to the Hajj. So look at the divine way by which God is already setting up for this announcement. Because the best occasion to have all Muslims gather is at the Hajj. You'll have hundreds of thousands of people who will come to the Hajj. The Prophet went to the pilgrimage along with over a hundred thousand Muslims. And this is called Hajjat al Wada, the final pilgrimage that the Prophet made. Now the Prophet was in Arafah when he wanted to make this announcement. He gathered the people, the Prophet started his sermon, then he started to allude to the Ahl al Bayt. He told them that there are leaders after me, 12 Imams after me, and the Prophet was setting the stage to announce Imam Ali السلام, as his Khalifa. But do you know what happened? This is history, my dear brothers and sisters. There was such a huge commotion, the Meccans cut him off. They started yelling and screaming to the point where the people couldn't hear the Prophet anymore. Companions have narrated this event. That's because Mecca was the stronghold of those Arabs who had enmity towards Imam Ali salam. They waged so many wars against the Prophet. Who was the number one defender? Imam Ali salam. They had lost many of their relatives at the sword of Imam Ali. So the Meccans could not stand accepting Imam Ali as the Khalifa. They simply could not accept that. They had that enmity. They had that hatred. So Jibreel tells the Prophet ﷺ, postpone the announcement. Wait for a better opportunity. So the Prophet ﷺ ends his speech. He's very disturbed that they, dis that they did this to him. Then after the Hajj, the Prophet marches north. He's going back to Medina. He reaches a very important intersection, a pathway travelers would usually pass by that area. It's called Juhfa. Jibra'il tells the Prophet, go to a place, there is an oasis by Juhfa. It's not too far from that place. And you should camp there. Now in Arabic, when you have an oasis of water in the desert, what do you call that? In Arabic, if you have like a ponding of water in the middle of the desert. What is that called? Ghadir. That's the meaning of Ghadir. The linguistic meaning of Ghadir is basically an oasis of water. So there was a well-known oasis at an area called Khum. That oasis is called Ghadir Khum. People, travelers, recognized. The Prophet went there and he camped for three days. The Prophet made an announcement. He said, those travelers, the hujjaj, the pilgrims, let's wait for them to gather here, bring them here. And those who were ahead of us in their journey, call them back. Tell them to come back. Jibra'il told the Prophet, this is the place for you to make that announcement. So now imagine, the third day, you have over a hundred thousand companions gathered at the oasis of Ghadir. 
It was a very hot day. The, all the companions remember how hot it was. And subhanAllah, there is a divine wisdom behind that. So no one forgets that event. So now, you're gathering all these companions, over a hundred thousand of them, under the hot scorching sun. Already the people knew a very important announcement is going to come from the Prophet because this is unprecedented. No time in history did the Prophet gather so many of his companions in one place just to deliver a sermon to them. But this was by the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, this was the setup of Ghadir. Today we have so many narrations in our Shia and Sunni books that confirm this event and that the Prophet ﷺ made an announcement about Imam Ali salam. There's no doubt about this event. You'll find some ignorant people trying to reject that this event happened today. But we have Sunni scholars like Al-Fakh Al-Razi. He's a historian. He's a scholar. He's an exegete, Mufassir of the Quran. You know what he says? He says, I did my own research. I found 400 sources for Ghadir. 400 sources, not one, not two, not three, but 400. And that's what has survived throughout history. By the way, he makes a comment here, Al-Fakhr al-Razi. He says, even though I've gathered 400 references and sources for Ghadir, I still feel uneasy about it. I don't know what to say about that. You have 400 sources about Ghadir, he's still not comfortable because he knows the truth isn't that Ghadir. Now today there are some Muslims who say from other schools of thought, they say, yeah, but it's not mentioned in Bukhari. Because it's not mentioned in Bukhari, I'm not going to accept this event. My dear brothers and sisters, if an event has 400 sources, and today we have the hadith of 110 companions who said, I've witnessed the event of Ghadir. What does that indicate? Does that mean that there is a problem in Ghadir, whether it happened or not? Or that shows you there is a problem in Bukhari? If you, the author of Bukhari, you've left out an event that hundreds of companions witnessed, and you have their reports, and yet you did not mention it, there is a problem in Bukhari, not in the event of Ghadir. When you have all these narrations about this event, so there is no shadow of doubt that the event of Ghadir did happen. And today, our sources are inundated with references to Ghadir. Let's now, my dear brothers and sisters, analyze the sermon of the Ghadir. Because it's the most unique sermon the Prophet gave. Do you know how long the sermon of Ghadir took? Usually the Prophet's sermons were brief. You know, like the Friday prayers, the other sermons. On average, they were five minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes. Not like our speeches. We go on and on and on for 45 minutes and bore you. The Prophet kept it brief. He'd speak for just a few minutes sometimes. Because people at the time, they were just learning about Islam. They had a short attention span. The Prophet would teach them the basics. But this sermon is at least one hour long. For an entire hour, the Prophet ﷺ spoke to his companions. And Imam al-Baqir gives us the full text of that speech. Various parts of that speech have been documented in various sources, but Imam al-Baqir gives us the full text. My dear brothers and sisters, read the text of Eid al-Ghadir sermon. It's it's a fascinating, beautiful sermon that the Prophet gave. Now imagine Rasulullah is standing on a pulpit, a makeshift pulpit. They brought this platform, they raised it. The Prophet is standing on this platform. He's looking at over a hundred thousand of his companions. There was a, another platform to the right. It was also slightly raised, but a little bit less than the Prophet. Imam Ali السلام, was standing on that platform. Everyone is now seeing the Prophet gave this sermon. I'd like to walk you through some passages of this sermon. The Prophet ﷺ starts his sermon by glorifying the Almighty Allah and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amongst the 
words that the Prophet said in the opening passage of his sermon. He's talking about Allah. He says, وَمُبْدِئًا وَمُعِيدًا وَكُلُّ أَمْرٍ إِلَيْهِ يَعُودٍ Allah is the one who gave you your origin. مُبْدِئًا Everything goes back to Allah. وَمُعِيدًا And everything goes back to Allah. Look at the beautiful words of the Prophet. Make sure that you center your life around the Almighty God. Because He is the starting point. He is the end point. Everyone shall go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you ready for that meeting with your Lord? Then the Prophet says, لا يعجل بانتقامه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very patient. One of the names of God is As-Sabur. He's patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not quickly deliver his revenge. Sometimes don't you get frustrated? You see people around you, they commit wrongdoing. Could be a friend, family member. You've been hurt, you've been violated. Or you look at oppressors around the world and all the injustice and you're like, what is God waiting for? Why don't you seek revenge from that person? That's the system of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't quickly deliver revenge. Why? Two quick reasons. Number one, it's a trial. Imagine if every time you did something bad, boom, you get hit with something. Allah hits you with something. Where's the trial? Where's the test? We'd definitely all be disciplined and we'd behave. Allah gives you room, some flexibility to try you, to test you. He does seek revenge, but it could be after a while. Number two, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah is giving you time to repent. Sometimes we tend to see others as evil and there's no chance for them. I've heard one of my friends, he said, if that person on the day of judgment who wronged me, if that person is forgiven and he'll go to paradise, wallah, I'm not going to put my feet in paradise with that person. <laughs> Habibi, don't limit the mercy of Allah. Allah's mercy is so vast. You yourself, you have faults, I have faults, and I expect Allah to forgive me. Sometimes Allah doesn't quickly deliver the vengeance, the revenge, the discipline to give you a chance. Maybe you repent. Maybe you re-examine what you're doing. But yes, it's a trial. And some others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them more time, so they do more evil, so He punishes them more. So the Prophet ﷺ beautifully states that in his sermon. Then he said, قَدْ فَهِمَ السَّرَائِرْ وَعَلِمَ الضَّمَائِرْ Allah knows what's in your heart. I can keep what's in my heart from you. You may not know what I'm thinking, what I'm planning, my feelings, what am I doing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. Keep that in mind. Sometimes we forget that Allah is really with us, ever present with us. Allah knows what's in your intentions. Then the Prophet then the Prophet states, Allah is the one who gave rise and existing existence to things when there was nothing. Look at this vast universe, my dear brothers and sisters. There was one point where there was nothing. No time, no space, no galaxy, no universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created something out of nothing and that's the great miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we human beings all we can do is rearrange the elements around us we've never been able to create something out of pure nothing that is the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another beautiful aspect of Allah's creation is that he created his creation and he gave it its form and image without looking at any previous example. Meaning Allah invented everything. Isn't that amazing? Just look at the human being. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you your physical appearance. Allah invented that. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes you wonder, subhanallah, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, for him to invent all these things, all these senses. We have five senses, right? Can you really think and grasp a sixth sense? Can you? 
these five senses that you have, can you describe them to someone who doesn't have them? Tfaddal, try. Someone who's born blind, let's say. Can you tell them what colors are? Red, white, blue. You can't. You can try to use words, but you cannot. See how we're limited with these senses that we have and we experience and we feel. Allah invented them out of nothing. And on the day of judgment in heaven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give us new senses for infinity. That's the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet is setting the stage by teaching the people about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّهُ اللَّهُ الَّذِي مَلَأَ الدَّهْرَ قُدْسُهُ He says, I swear He's the one Lord whose purity has filled the entire universe. Beautiful description by the Prophet. He says, the purity of God. Think of that. Quds is purity. Al-Quddus is the one who's pure. It's one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purity of God, the goodness of God, has filled the entire universe. Everything in the universe is goodness. It's only us, the human beings, we, the human beings. When we decide to commit a wrong act, that's evil. When we reject the goodness of Allah. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in purity, everything in goodness. Then, the Prophet sallallahu teaches us that we're just servants of Allah. Whatever we hear God commanding us, we obey. I'm nothing but a servant. In fact, the Prophet says, the way I am with God, if I feel God wants something from me, I rush towards it. Even if he does not explicitly ask me. Have you seen sometimes you know your parents want something? They don't tell you, they don't ask you, but you feel like they want something. The hadith says when it comes to your parents, Jump to serve them before they ask you. That's a good son and a good daughter according to Islamic law. Even before they ask you, you know your dad wants something, your mom wants, needs something, you, you go and fulfill it for them. The Prophet says that's how we are with Allah. If I feel like God want, wants something from me, I jump. Are we like that today, my dear brothers and sisters? These days we have to drag ourselves. Salah, which is the pillar of faith, I have to drag myself, right? When it comes to fulfilling my financial obligations, whether it's zakat, khums, fitr, I have to force myself. When it comes to music, entertainment, all these aspects, I have to drag myself and force myself. The Prophet says, be eager, jump. That's a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you seen people in love? It's fascinating, it teaches you a lot about life. Have you seen someone? One brother once told me, he had you know, fallen in love, very severe, depressing love. You know what he told me? It's fascinating though. He said, Sayyid, I had my iPhone. Whenever I would get a notification, notification, right? I don't know who it's from. My heart would jump. Literally, I could feel my heart jumping out of my chest. Why? Because there's a possibility it could be her. And then when you hear these narrations about the Imams of Ahlul Bayt before Adhan jumping, someone's like, come on, that's too extreme. Habibi, with a fellow human being, you understand that and you do that, you fall into that. And Allah is the source of all goodness, the source of all love, the source of all beauty in the universe. The Prophet says that's who a true servant is. He jumps to honor the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now the Prophet is setting the stage in the first part of his sermon. Let's now transition into the next part. In the next part of the sermon, the Prophet ﷺ states, لَأَنَّهُ قَدْ أَعْلَمَنِي أَنَّهُ إِنْ لَمْ أُبَلِّغْ مَا أَنزَلَ إِلَيَّ فِي حَقِّ عَلِيٍ فَمَا بَلَّغْتُ رِسَالَتَهُ The Prophet now draws the attention of the companions to the main reason why he's giving them the sermon. He told them, my companions, God has ordered me something. If I do not convey it, Allah would consider me as one who has betrayed his message. 
And it's as if I have not fulfilled the message of God. And that announcement is about Ali. Now imagine, over 100,000, the Prophet is on an elevated platform. Next to him, Imam Ali salam, they're standing, everyone's watching them. Suddenly now the people know, okay, this is about Imam Ali. He's going to make an announcement about Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Then he recited verse 67 of Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ya ayyuhal rasoolu ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. But then the Prophet says, I anticipate there's going to be opposition. I know some of you are not comfortable with this announcement. I know some of you are jealous of Ali ibn Abi Talib because he has the virtues, because he's qualified. I know that. However, this is the command of Allah. I have to convey it, even though I know there's going to be resistance, there's going to be opposition. But I have to convey this message from the Almighty God. Then the Imam, then the Prophet in the third part of his sermon, he says, ثُمَّ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَلِيٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَلِيٌ وَلِيُّكُمْ وَإِمَامُكُمْ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ رَبِّكُمْ So after me, Ali is the wali and the imam. ثُمَّ الْإِمَامَةُ فِي ذُرِّيَّةِ مِنْ وُلْدِهِ إِلَى يَوْمْ تَلْقَوْنَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَ Then after him, there's going to be a line of imams. You have to follow them until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see now clearly the Prophet also informs his ummah of the imams who will come from his progeny and the progeny of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Then the Prophet says, Ma'ashara nas faddiluh. O people, give preference to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Don't give preference to others. Why? فَمَا مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا وَقَدْ عَلَّمْتُهُ عَلِيًّا For there is no knowledge given to me by Allah except that I gave that knowledge to Ali. He's the most knowledgeable. He's the most qualified. Follow him. I'm not asking you to follow Ali because he's my cousin or son-in-law. No, because he has the knowledge. He's the most qualified. He knows what he's doing. Then the Prophet ﷺ tells us how trustworthy Ali ibn Abi Talib is. He says, Amartuhu anillah. I con commanded Ali on behalf of Allah. And yanama fi madja'i fafa'al. I asked Ali on the night of the migration to sleep in my bed. So he, he did. In other words, the Prophet is telling his companions, Who other than Ali did I put my full trust in? I put my full faith in. Imagine it's critical. Forty men had gathered to assassinate the Prophet on that night. The Prophet goes to Imam Ali. He did not go to other companions. He goes to Ali. And Ali at this point was not his son-in-law yet. He, had, he was not married in Mecca. Imam Ali married in Medina. He told him, Ali, I have a secret. Jibra'il told me that tonight they're going to, they're going to try to assassinate me. Are you willing to sleep in my bed? If the Prophet entrusted Imam Ali in such critical moments, my dear brothers and sisters, how did the Ummah entrust others when it came to critical events like Khilafah? Isn't this injustice and disobedience to the Prophet? The Prophet, whenever he was in danger, he would entrust Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, not anybody else. But unfortunately, this is what the Ummah did. Then the Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells his ummah that my Ahlul Bayt are with the Qur'an. They shall never separate. Just as the Qur'an is infallible, my Ahlul Bayt are infallible. These are the first three parts of the Ghadir sermon. In the fourth part, the Prophet said that famous announcement that you've all memorized. In the fourth part, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked all the Muslims, أَلَسْتُ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ do I not have a greater right over you than your own self? Because that's mentioned in Surah Al-Ahzab. They said, yes, Ya, ya Rasulullah, we admit, you have a greater right over us. You have authority and guardianship over us. So the Prophet says, so you all admit. They said, yes. At that point, the Prophet raised the hand of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And he said, أَلَا مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ 
فهذا علي مولا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Whomever I am his mawla, his guardian Whomever I have authority over Ali ibn Abi Talib is his mawla and guardian And the Prophet made that famous prayer Allahumma wali man wala Wa'adi man aada Wansurna al-nasara Wakhdul man khadala Oh Allah, befriend and support whoever befriends and supports Ali. And oh Allah, be the enemy of whoever shows enmity to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So when you look at the Ghadir sermon, these are only the first four parts. There are seven more parts, my dear brothers and sisters. Remember, it's an hour long sermon. Seven more parts to the sermon of Eid al-Ghadir. We don't have time to analyze those seven parts. But the Prophet warns this ummah. That if you abandon Ali ibn Abi Talib, this ummah will be in chaos until my grandson, the Mahdi, is going to come and fill the world with justice. In the Eid al-Ghadir sermon, the Prophet even mentions his grandson, the Mahdi. So the Prophet gave that hour-long sermon. And then after that, there were two tents. In one tent was the Prophet. There was another tent raised for Imam Ali. The companions came, over a hundred thousand of them. They entered the tent of the Prophet, they congratulated him. When they congratulated him, the Prophet told them, go to the tent of Ali, congratulate him. All of them came, my dear brothers and sisters, and they congratulated Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi, the Sunni historian and scholar, he says, Umar ibn al-Khattab came to Imam Ali and he told him, Bakhin, Bakhin laka ya Ali. Congratulations, O Ali. Bravo, Ali. You have now become my mawla, my master and the mawla of all believers. All of them gave him the allegiance at Ghadir, my dear brothers and sisters. On the Day of Judgment, there's no excuses. And then when the man came, it was the turn of the woman to give bay'ah. Yes, women were also present on the day of Ghadir. Lady Fatima was there, some of the wives of the Prophet were there, thousands of other uh, Muslim women were there. Now obviously the men, they would shake hands to give bay'ah, but the women don't shake hands with someone who's not mahram to them. So the Prophet said, bring a container of water, put a curtain between it. On one side, Ali ibn Abi Talib will stand. On the other side, the woman will come. Imam Ali السلام, will dip his hand into the water and the woman on the other side of the bucket, they will put their hands in that bucket and they tell him, we have now given you the allegiance of wilaya. And that's how the woman also participated in this beautiful ceremony. In short, my dear brothers and sisters, that's Eid al-Ghadir. We commemorate Eid al-Ghadir, number one, because Allah tells us to. It's Eidullah Azza wa Jal. It's the command of Allah to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib after the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Number two, by commemorating Ghadir, we are reminding ourselves of the pure leadership after the Prophet. Today, if you want your life to change, if you want to be on the path of Allah, change your lifestyle for the better. Learn from the lessons of Imam Ali How Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at other people. His sincerity for the Almighty God. How Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib judged other people, ruled other people. The compassion that he had for others. You know, today in the West, Western countries, they boast about their welfare system, social security, Medicaid, you name it. Imam Ali السلام, instituted this 14 centuries ago. During those four years that he ruled, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib told his governors that there are categories of people I want you to put them on the Muslim treasury, Bayt Mal al Muslimin, the public funds. The Imam mentions them by name. A woman who's a widow, there's no one to take care of her. He tells his governor, Malik al Ashtar, give her a monthly salary. Don't let anyone exploit her, take advantage of her. You have someone who's disabled, they have a disease, long-term disease, put them on the payroll. Those people who are stuck in severe poverty, put them on the payroll. This is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. 
He was so sensitive, my dear brothers and sisters, when it came to his own self. You're all familiar with the candle example of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Look at today, unfortunately, how there are many people in positions of power and they squander the resources. One day a man came to see Imam Ali alayhi salam. The Imam alayhi salam told him it was at night, in the evening, dark. The Imam told him, is this a personal matter that you have with me? Or does it concern Muslims? He said to the Imam, no, it's a personal issue. There was a candle next to Imam Ali. How much does a candle cost? A candle. The Imam blew the candle. He turned it off. It's dark now. The man was surprised. He told him, oh Ali, why did you put out the candle? The Imam salam said, this candle was purchased from the public treasury. And you said you have a personal matter. I cannot use something that belongs to all Muslims for a personal issue. That's why I put it out. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is how sensitive he was when he was the caliph. He had millions under his disposal. But that's the example that he showed people, my dear brothers and sisters. With Allah, he had the best relationship. And Masjid al-Kufa at night, the Imam السلام, had a nightly habit. At night he would sit and cry and speak to Allah. He was busy, there were wars waged against him. He was really tired, but those moments at night were the moments that energized Imam Ali. You know, sometimes you just need something to refresh you, energize you. Some of you could be that coffee, right? That just energizes you, two shots of espresso. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, no. It was at night, he'd spend moments with his Lord, he'd be energized for the whole day. His munajat at night, read them my dear brothers and sisters. Mawlaya ya Mawlai, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman, yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. Imam Ali says, oh Allah, I ask you for safety. Why Ali? For which day? He says, for that day where nothing is going to help me. No wealth, no children. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except if on that day you come with a pure heart, with a sound heart. On that day, that good heart is going to save you. The Imam would say this and he would cry. Oh Allah, I ask you for safety on that day when the oppressors will bite at their hands. They would say, oh God, we wish we'd have followed your path. We wish we would not surround ourselves with bad friends who caused us to deviate from the path. Peer pressure. The negative influence of friends. Imam Ali would actually cry about that. So on Ghadir, my dear brothers and sisters, we uphold the legacy of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So let's read about the Imam alayhi salam. Nahj al is this treasure of knowledge. Study it, read it. It will purify your heart, illuminate your mind. It will show you how to be a good person in this world, how to prepare for the Akhirah. So my dear brothers and sisters, I sincerely congratulate you on the beautiful occasion of Eid al-Ghadir. Tomorrow there's many a'mal, don't miss them. Fasting tomorrow is equivalent to fasting 60 years. Want the ajr of 60 years of fasting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Fast tomorrow. And there's a dua in Mafatih al-Janan or in the A'mal books, you can find them. There is a prayer, there is a salah that you do close to noon. Because it was around the time of noon when the Prophet declared Imam Ali as his successor. If you do that prayer and you say that dua after it, the hadith states it's as if you were there on Ghadir and you gave bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib So tomorrow there is many a'mal. Try to do some of them. Spend a few minutes to observe tomorrow. Celebrate it with your family and friends. Talk about how Imam Ali has changed your life. What can you learn from the legacy of Imam Ali? And how can we use the legacy of Imam Ali today in our 21st century to achieve progress and to better ourselves? So my dear brothers and sisters, I congratulate you on this event of Eid al-Ghadir. And truly, truly, we are infinitely thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he has given us the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you're down, things are going bad for you. Remember, Allah has given you a treasure greater than the universe. That's the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Because the wilaya of Imam Ali takes you to the wilaya of Rasulullah. And Rasulullah takes you to the wilaya of Allah. One day, Imam Zain al-Abidin saw a man, one of his companions. He was down, depressed, going through trouble, financial trouble. The imam told him, what's the matter? He said, I'm poor. Yabna Rasulullah, I'm poor. I'm suffering from poverty. The imam السلام, asked him an interesting question. The imam told him, you have faith in Allah, right? And the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. He said, yes, of course. The imam told him, are you willing to sell your faith, if you could theoretically? Are you willing to sell it for a hundred thousand golden coins, dinars at the time? A hundred thousand golden, pure gold coins. He said, no, I'm not. The imam told him, how dare you consider yourself poor when you own something more valuable than a hundred thousand golden coins? You're not willing to sell it. Don't say I'm poor. I'm the richest of the rich. Because Allah has given me guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt and inshallah the motivation to follow them. So as'adallah ayyamakum kul aam wa antum bikhair. I congratulate you on Eid al-Ghadir. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please stick around. We now have a bonfire discussion with some nice poetry to hear from our dear brothers and sisters. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.